Um, so I will talk about the Bayesian perspective to the image reconstruction, so it will be slightly different. Actually, particularly, I will talk about two different applications that are kind of linked together. One of them will be the image reconstruction itself, and the other one will be identifying outliers or abnormal patterns in the images. Um, but before starting, I should acknowledge the students who actually um, you know, were um, instrumental in making this all possible, um, and the collaborations uh, with Klaus, Roger, and Ben here, and Nick and the funding agencies. Um, so before starting the talk, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with generative models. Um, so but let me give you a brief um, recap of generative modeling in medical image computing. Uh, so the basic idea is to be able to model the joint distribution of a set of observations, for example, Y here, and the identity of interest that we're after, in this case, the M. So the set of observations can be the image itself, can be the case space in the MR, um, case, can be initial segmentation, can be any type of measurements. And the identity of interest can be, well, again, the image, the segmentation, the class assignment, relative information, outcome of a certain treatment. And I was actually really interested in a specific factorization, which is first we have the prior model, and then we have the observation model. The prior model tells us what reality should be, what are plausible things that can happen in the world. And the observation model links how these plausible things are linked to the actual observations that we've seen. So essentially, for a very simple example, where I have this beautiful um, high resolution 500 micron cube image here, um, and this image is a real image, so it's actually a sample from this distribution of what plausible is. And then I have observation, which is basically a noisy version of it. So in this case, for example, the observation um, that links, or how to link the observation to the plausibility is simply by adding noise to the, um, to the image itself. Now, in, in Bayesian inference, in the, what we're actually most of them interested in is actually the posterior distribution. So what we're interested in is we usually see this and we ask the question what are plausible um, identities of interest that might have given rise to the observations that we've seen. Um, what this means is I start with my prior belief of what the world should be and then I basically use the Bayes update rule to uh, update my belief and to really match things to the observations. <coughs> Now, um, very obvious, but um, sometimes some audiences um, lack this link, which is, well, if I simply take the log of it and say, you know what, I'm actually interested in the, um, the value that maximizes the posterior distribution, so the mode of the posterior distribution, I end up with the usual data term and regularization term optimization problem that um, Florian spoke about um, in the previous lecture. Um, one thing to note here, the distance the distinction between the generative model and the, um, the, the discriminative model is the fact that in generative model, we're really modeling the prior and the observation model. While in discriminative modeling, what we're actually interested in is directly the posterior distribution. So we have a set of samples observations, and for all those observations, we have the identities of interest that correspond to them. So we really learn a mapping that goes from directly Y to N. If you're very careful and if you do everything right, you can even hope to learn the posterior distribution in that case. Um, in a very um, cartoon representation, actually, if we go back to the generative modeling, what we're interested in is two different components. One of them is the plausible images. So basically here I distinguish it as, you know, a, a, a hyperspace that lives in a higher dimensional space. And then I have the ball of observations that's created by the observations. So that basically means that any point in this ball here, in this gray area, satisfies the observations perfectly. Okay. And if I go away from this ball, the grayness decreases. That basically means that I, less I satisfy the observations to a lesser degree. So let's think about it. If I actually take a point here in my image space, which is actually not on the set of plausible images, I might have some results like this. So on the left-hand side, I basically have 28 by 28 patches that extract from brain MRI. So they look nice. They look like uh, we see the structures that we see in brain MRI here. And the X that I just sampled out there for the illustration would, for example, look like random noise. There are still images. They're just not plausible images. Now, if I take a certain area, for example, I take in this case, just the points here that satisfy a certain set of observations for the case of um, reconstructing MRI from undersampled data, what I would end up, for example, are image patches like this. So they kind of resemble what reality should be like, but they have also some artifacts on them. So they're not real, but they're almost real. Okay. Um, 
what we're interested in the Bayesian inference is basically characterization of this red area here, so the intersection between the prior and the observation models. Um, specifically, actually, you can also talk about the map inference, which is basically the mode of the distribution, which would lie somewhere here in the red area that has the highest degree satisfying both the observations and the prior. So, um, what it means, for example, I can have the real ground truth M in which here, that's a sample from the distribution of prior distribution. The observation in this case can be the Y, so images that are constructed from subsampled case space measurements and zero field. And then you can, for example, the maximum posterior estimate would be the reconstruct image M star here. Um, there are really two aspects to this point. One of them is how do we construct the prior itself, and the other one is how do we construct the observation model and then find the area right here. Okay, so this was a very a quick generative, um, quick recap for the generative modeling. And um, one might ask, why do you even want to use generative modeling? Well, there are certain really nice advantages of it. Um, that was one of the discussions that um, uh, Michael had in the last lecture as well. So first of all, it really decouples the observation model from your prior model. So you really have two distinct versions of um, how the observations are acquired and what the reality should be. It actually improves a lot of robustness through the prior knowledge that we have, and we have a lot of prior knowledge when it comes to medical images. Anatomy varies, but actually it doesn't vary that much. Um, in theory, you can actually train such models with minimal number of observations, and I will actually talk about cases where there are no observations, where there are no examples that are used. So that's actually quite nice. It actually allows you to go beyond labeled data sets. Okay, um, so this is fine. The generative modeling is there, and it's actually we've been here. Are there any questions on that part? Okay, so very fast. Fine, so maybe the interesting question is what can networks offer in this case? And what can networks offer is actually related to the latent variable models. So what we're interested in is really identifying this prior distribution that can characterize samples that we see in the real world. So let's call it P of M. Latent variable model says that, you know what, this P of M, or the M itself, lives in a very high dimensional space, so it's extremely difficult to estimate any type of distribution to it using any models that we've seen. So the latent variable says, you know what, instead of estimating a distribution in capital D, very high dimensions, you should actually assume that the data lives in a you know, lower dimension manifold and um, really estimate the distribution in a much smaller space in um, D dimensions, and you can even think that that space is Euclidean. Okay? And then there are two really components. One of them is the distribution in this Euclidean space, and more importantly, how do I link the images, the high dimensional space to the lower dimensional space? Now, um, it, looks, it might look a little bit complicated, but essentially we've known, or I think everyone in this room knows a very good example for this type of algorithm, which is a simple principal component analysis. In the principal component analysis, I have the P of C, which is a unit Gaussian, and what really matters is this, this link between the lower dimension Euclidean space and the image space, which is simply a linear map. So essentially what it does is, it takes the Euclidean space, rotates it, um, creates a hyperplane in the higher dimensional space, and then everything about the latent variable models and the probabilistic interpretation just follows nicely. Obviously, the limitation is very clear. This is just a hyperplane. So what we want is, instead of hyperplane, can we actually put something a bit more flexible that can actually curve itself and fit really to the data that we've seen. This idea is actually not very new. It was really proposed in 1995, and this is kind of a shame because um, this paper is the first thing that proposes this algorithm, and yet it it gets very little number of citations. So if you're using these type methods, please cite this paper because it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and this is the origin of it and it never gets cited. Um, but the idea is actually quite simple. Um, David McKay at the time said that, uh, well, in the PCA, this is a linear model, why don't we just put a parametric um, network here to have a nonlinear map? So really, just the, the only difference is you go from the Z to the M using a network. And um, at the time, the main question is, okay, I have a parametric map, so I can actually, I have these parameters that I have to tune. How do I tune them? Well, I have a certain set of observations that I see in real life, and I know that they're real, they're the identity zones. So I really tweak the number of parameters to increase their likelihood. So what happens, for example, I can simply optimize the joint likelihood of all the observations, assuming independence, right? 
the issue here is, well, each of these ones actually need to solve this integral right here. Okay? So at the time, what he proposed was, you know what? I'm a physicist, I will just use Monte Carlo integration. That's, in, that's quite easy. So he basically approximated these integrals using simple um, Monte Carlo integration and then optimized the double sum. Now, obviously, if you actually talk about, you know, high dimensional Z spaces, this sum here requires very large number of samples to really approximate the actual integral. So at the end of that paper, somewhere, he says, you know what, very high dimensional spaces, you should just use important sampling. And then he puts a dot. Uh, that's 1995. Um, about 20 years later, so, oh, sorry for that. So about 20 years later, we are, um, end up in the case that some people thought that, okay, you know what, let's create this variation of encoders, which is basically implementing important sampling in density networks. So instead of having, um, I still have the same model here, so the link between the latent space and the image space is a network, but now I also have a posterior distribution, or approximate posterior distribution, that goes from the image to the latent space to give me the distribution. So if I assume certain forms here, I can basically optimize this entire thing together. I think some of you already know this, um, using um, basically the evidence lower bound. And I basically optimize, you know, two terms. One of them links the Euclidean space to the image space, and the other one tries to uh, make sure that the posterior distribution is really close to the prior itself. And this entire thing comes from the fact that the posterior distribution should best approximate the actual posterior distribution that we would have in the system once we define the map between Z to M. Okay. Um, given the amount of time, I will not spend too much time here. In any case, what's really important is actually what we gain by really giving the ability to the problem to basically curve that mapping. So here we have the real patches again, 28 by 28. Um, and here are um, patches that are generated by a probabilistic PCA model, so linear model, okay? I use the same number of components and train a variation autoencoder in this case and generate patches again. Now, notice that these patches actually really capture the essence of what is being a brain patch. I don't know what it is, but um, more specifically, I see, for example, that the white matter is in the gray matter, um, white matter between white matter and the CSF always lies a nice curved gray matter and I can actually create variations of these curved structures that looks plausible. Now you can actually ask, yes, I know, but you're using a linear model here, so essentially you should use a higher number of components here. You can do that, but anyone who's familiar with PCA will know that uh, now actually you're really trying to fit the noise, so the generations that you would have really are not that plausible anymore. So it's really, there's a huge gain in actually embedding a nonlinear model to trans make the transition between the lower dimensional late Euclidean space and the higher dimensional image space. Okay, so what can we do with this structure? Now we have this capability to do real interesting things. Um, one of the questions that we actually wondered and wanted to solve was the reconstruction MRI. If we have this prior model, can we actually use it? So, no, I don't really have to say this, but MRI is really cool. We can get all these beautiful images. I stop. It's particularly one image here from John Polmeni, which actually is quite impressive that actually gets the blood vessels. Okay. Um, so we all agree that MRI is nice. We've been working with MRI. And um, the MRI reconstruction problem, Florian gave a better uh, introduction. You know, there is actually a long path that goes from the patient to the image itself. And this long path really has lots of things to do with the physics, which I will simply put a Turkish carpet on it and completely ignore it. <laughs> um, they don't exist. Um, what I'm interested in is a small part that actually goes from the measurements that are acquired in the Fourier space to the images themselves. Now, um, there was a very nice introduction. The basic idea is MR measures um, values at different frequencies in the Fourier transform of the image. I can get back the image using inverse Fourier transform. This, uh, getting each line here or getting each measurement costs time. So I want to be able to get away by actually measuring fewer number of lines. But if I do that, I basically introduce artifacts in the image. So the basic problem with image reconstruction is I want to get this many lines, still get the beautiful image time after. Okay, now let's build a Bayesian model for image reconstruction. Again, we have two parts. One of them is this ball. And then the other one will be the underlying curved space here. 
So the ball itself with the MR is actually is quite well known to the first order degree. Okay? We basically have the image here and we have an encoding matrix that you know, um, converts in the Fourier transform, adds sensitivities of different coils and then simply subsamples it and do something to it, adds a bias and so on and so forth. And then we basically add this noise that comes from the thermal processes in the MR image um, that's roughly Gaussian. And then we basically have a complex signal at the end. Okay? So essentially, whenever I see something like this, this is a linear model. Linear model, at least squares, gives me actually a Gaussian distribution, a Gaussian model for the observation. Okay, that's quite easy. What is more tricky is this guy here. How do you model this? And uh, Florian gave a kind of um, a background to this, so I will basically you know, use that, leverage that, and simply put it in completely Bayesian perspective, so nothing will be done here. So if I talk about, for example, the, um, the um, compressed sensing framework with very total variation. I basically use again the same probabilistic Bayesian framework, but instead um, I basically have the prior that's exponential of the total variation term here. Um, well, I can play multiple tricks on it. For example, I can go to the very end and use kernel density estimate to get the prior from the images. I can use principal component analysis and even actually compute the principal components themselves from the image that's been acquired, like in KT sense. Or I can use really sparse dictionary learning type of ideas, kind of. I feel like these are the, the, the basic elements of uh, what the neural networks are doing, in a sense, and really create sparse dictionaries for the priors themselves. And um, essentially what I do is, again, I solve the basic problem. I simply maximize the posterior distribution with different priors and observation terms. So when I do this, I get really, really good results. You know, I have the original image, I have an undersampled image that actually only one third of the measurements are uh, taken. I can apply total variation, get a nice image out here, or I can apply a dictionary learning method that really like state of the art thing and get even a better reconstruction. Now, maybe it's difficult to um, appreciate why this is better from that perspective. So if we can zoom in, we'll see, for example, this has this patchy cartoony artifact, so basically, TV is wonderful for patch images, but not so much for real images. But then you can correct it with sparse dictionary learning. So there is a basis that sparsifies the entire thing. Um, I'm going to put one note here, which is notice that there is a small part of the anatomy. Actually, if you look closer to the images, there are these small details that are anatomically relevant and plausible that cannot be captured with these methods. Because they don't really have an idea of what the anatomy should be. So what we want to do is actually add the knowledge of anatomy to this problem. And what are we going to use? We're basically going to use the basic ideas that we had with the prior modeling using networks. So instead of actually using a um, handcrafted model here, we will say that my prior model simply, my prior model should simply be really a, a density network that's characterized by a variational auto encoder. So what this means is I basically, you know, I'm going to solve the map estimation problem again. Um, I have my observation model, that's the Gaussian, and I have the prior model that's defined in terms of the um, network. Now there's one catch to it, which is the network itself is not perfect because it is a model. So actually I don't really have this picture, but rather I have a picture that looks something like this. So there is actually a gap between the observations, what is possible for the observations and where the prior lies. Um, but the nice thing is, for a computer, this is differentiable. So whether I use a network here, or I use a mathematical formulation, doesn't really care. I just want to take the derivative of it from the perspective of a computer. So it's just a, the same operation. So noticing this, we basically propose this very simple model saying that I want to have an optimization which starts, for example, the zero field image that satisfies the observations perfectly. I want to take a few approximate gradient steps towards the prior, go down to it, and then, oh, I went too far away from the observation, so I want to project it back to the, um, to the observation space and do it a few more times to really get um, to a point that's um, closest, uh, that with the, within the ball of the observations, but closest to the prior. Now, there are some tricks here that um, I think they told me, Mark and Ben told me to add equations to the slides, so I, should, I added the equations in the slides. There's a trick to it, which is all these methods, like actually getting the real prior is quite difficult because I have to integrate over the Z space and it's a high dimensional space. And David McKay in 95 said it's very difficult. So what we do is we don't actually evaluate the prior perfectly. Instead, we simply 
assume that the prior can be modeled somehow with the evidence lower bound. So when we take a derivative, we take the approximation, we take the, um, we make the approximation that the derivative of prior should be roughly similar to the derivative of the evidence lower bound. Okay, so when I do this, what happens in the end is something like this. So you see the reconstruction that's uh, going on in the video, and you see kind of there's, um, at the beginning, there's kind of a heartbeat effect. So what happens is the slow transitions are you move towards the prior, and then the heartbeat effects are actually you go back to the observation space. OK. Um, so what does it look like? If I actually, again, compare it with what I've seen before, OK, from this angle, it also gets some kind of a nice image. Um, and if I compare it with, for example, the feed-forward network, ADMM net, that which also gets a nice image as well. But really, the details um, are important if I actually zoom to the same structure because I embed some kind of anatomical knowledge in this model, I can actually retrieve the small details that should be there. Like there is no gray matter that's the size of my fist. So basically, there should be a white matter inside. So the prior says that you need to put it there, otherwise it's not real. And if you don't add that even in the networks, then actually you might really lose information. Um, OK. There's one thing that's actually quite important in this model, which is the decoupling of the observation model from the prior. So what does that mean? If I decouple the observation model, then I can actually use exactly the same trained model for any type of subsampling factors, any type of subsampling um, types, any type of thing. So basically, because the prior is completely different, the training doesn't really care about it. So what advantage does it give me? Well, it gives me one particular advantage. So um, I'm assuming, so this is from the Nature paper that was published, and I'm assuming the reviewer asked for this experiment, uh, because I don't think this is the type of experiment that they would put in the paper themselves. So what they do is they have a certain undersampling pattern that they train their model on, and then they deviate from that undersampling pattern and see how well the um, algorithm works. So as you deviate from the undersampling pattern used in the training, then your accuracy starts dropping. Well, it's not surprising, it's okay. And there's some drop rate, and then they say in the paper that drop rate is uh, gracefully slow. Um, which is nice, but it's theoretically, it's not very elegant. Like you want a model that, that you shouldn't really care about the undersampling pattern. So we did the same experiments with the ADMM net, and actually we've seen very similar results saying that, well, if you change, if you change, uh, if you make a difference between the undersampling pattern used in training and testing, you actually can reduce the accuracy. Okay. Um, if you actually decouple the prior from the observation model, you don't. You basically keep it at exactly the same level because the model doesn't really care about the observation, how you actually acquire the observations. Um, so I did not talk about the complex nature of the things, but um, you can assume that everything is, lives in the complex space, so you have the magnitude and the phase images that are being estimated at the same time. Um, very quickly, we were really kind of curious what happens if you actually take the model that's trained on one set of images, especially, for example, in this case, the images that are coming from the Human Connectome Project and apply it to another set that's acquired with slightly different acquisitions and has pathologies in it. Um, well, not very surprisingly, it does a certain job, it's okay with the reconstructions, it actually can reconstruct the pathologies to some extent as well. So it's kind of interesting to see that it actually um, does the transition a little bit, but obviously you would need such images in your training set to be able to do this transition as well. Um, one thing that I wanted to show, so there was quite a bit of um, questions about the uncertainty in the last lecture, and uh, we had a recent um, presentation at the ESMRMB maybe three months ago, and we're preparing an article which basically says, well, I've shown the map estimate, but it's obviously kind of, um, I'm going to say trivial, and my PhD student will kill me, but it's trivial to think about just, just sampling from posterior distribution. Like, unfortunately, it's not trivial. It's a ridiculous amount of work, but you can do it. Um, so what happens in the end is actually you really sample from the posterior distribution. Here I show the image. I show, for example, the, um, the zero field image with one spot measurements. This is the reconstruction. And this is the uncertainty map. And there are really interesting things happening. Wherever you have actually discrepancy between the observation and the uh, reconstruction, you have a high uncertainty here. Um, so that's all I'm going to talk about at this point for this. And I want to make one more thing, um, which is this distinction in the concept of prior. So um, I think there are two notions of prior in the literature. One of them is the priors that I've talked about in the density networks, where actually the knowledge lives in the weights um, of the architecture. 
So, and then you can really evaluate the likelihood, really the probability of how likely this image can be. Um, the nice thing is with this, you can have actually meaningful derivatives, for example, through the elbow that guides you towards the high prior areas. There's also the other prior notion, for example, um, the deep prior image that's coming from Ulyanov, which basically embeds the prior in the architecture itself. And um, there, I, I feel like there's a big question mark, which is like, most of these papers that actually use this have this interesting point saying that, oh, and by the way, we train it for 1,000 iterations. Well, because if it's raised for 5,000 iterations, it fails. Um, so you have to be very careful. Actually, there's a very clever paper from Michael's group recently, which actually regularizes this entire process, so avoids this. Um, I don't know if you've already talked about it, but maybe I can briefly tell about it. <laughs> okay. So actually, like, you can, it, it's interesting to use these things, but you really have to be careful. So what Michael did, for example, the student to say that, yeah, you can use this, you can actually, you know, um, encode the, the prior in the architecture and do an optimization during test time. But in the optimization, you basically say that, for example, in a temporal sequence, the sequence images should lie on, for example, a curve in the latent space. Okay? So that actually regularizes the entire process and the optimization becomes feasible and you don't really go to crazy um, um, things. Okay, so that's all I want to talk about this model. Okay, so moving slightly away from reconstruction, I actually want to talk about the abnormality detection, which is also kind of um, close to my heart and it's also very linked to this problem. So how can we actually use the same ideas to do abnormality detection? Um, Briefly, the question is simple. You have an image that actually has parts that are normal and parts that shouldn't be there, that are the lesions. And clinically relevant, you want to really find those areas and identify what they are. So the state of the art thing is basically to do supervised learning. So you learn a mapping that really goes from Y, the observations, to the M, and you optimize the parameters to minimize the cost in a training set. But I suspect this is not how much, this is not how humans do it. I feel like humans are actually doing something else. So um, how many of you have never seen a brain MRI? I think that's an arbitrary question, but I showed you some. <laughs> so I'm just gonna repeat once more. This is a brain MRI, and then I'm going to show you two images, and I'm going to ask you which areas do you think that should not be there? <laughs> that's five seconds, that's fine. So um, it's clear actually that humans are extremely good at spotting what should not be there, even when they see very little examples. And that's really fascinating. Uh, and, and why does this happen? That's really quite an interesting question, but if we can actually make an algorithm do it, and I think like we, we get one step closer to really working like a radiologist. So um, the Bayesian model has one solution to this, or one alternative approach to this, which is basically saying that now I still want to create this manifold of plausible things, but now my plausible is normative distributions. So basically it's the distribution of healthy images. So when I get an image that has some kind of abnormality, what I simply do is I want to basically find the point that's closest to this. So basically map of this abnormal image in my normal space and find the difference as the abnormality, okay? Now, outlier detection, abnormal detection in medical imaging is actually not a new question. So once in a while, one crazy person actually proposes something and then they stay silent for another five years because the problem is so hard that you get very low accuracies. So since actually the 2000, beginning of 2000, there were like constant attempts, right? You know, once Kuhn attempted and Prastava attempted and Davatsko said I have another idea, but it's very rare and very rapid. And the, basically the state of the art without any learning is to say that I have a normal image and that's coming from a healthy individual. I deform this image to map it to the um, image of the patient and I look at the differences. And this registration, whenever you have some kind of high artifacts, obviously fails because it's a difficult problem itself. So what we're going to do is we're going to leverage this idea. So we had this prior information that actually I can generate real looking samples from it. And I want to train a network that actually encodes a normative distribution this time. Okay. So I define, the only thing that I need to define now for this problem is actually the observation model. So I have the image without the lesion. And then I have the disease coming in as an additive model. And I have the image with the lesion. And I'm going to solve again the maximum, maximum a posterior problem here. So I have the observation model that's coming from here and the prior model. Now, um, the prior model is clear. Again, I basically encode the normative distribution of what healthy images of, or images of healthy people should look like in a network. And for the observation model itself, there I basically, I don't exactly know what tumors look like. 
I can actually learn it from data, but in this case, I don't want to learn it from data because I want to be able to take any type of abnormality, no matter what they are. So I say, you know what, brain abnormalities um, should be somehow close contiguous areas. Mathematically, I know kind of an idea how to define it, which is basically saying that they should have a very low TV cost. Okay? So, then the optimization basically looks like, again, you can blame Tom, Mark, and Ben for the equations. The optimization looks like now I have the entire model. I want to optimize the posterior distribution. And ideally, the posterior distribution, again, is the observation model and the likelihood, uh, the prior. The prior is very difficult to compute, so I basically integrate the elbow and say that the gradient of the elbow should be similar to the gradient of the, um, the actual prior. Then, once I have this, I have the two terms. This is differentiable code. This is differentiable model. I can basically put them all together and run a very simple gradient descent. OK, so what I do is I start from the abnormal part and slowly move towards the uh, normal image space to find the image that looks like it. OK, now what we did was we did some experiments. We took um, uh, images from healthy individuals, about 600 of them. We feed this normative distribution model, and then we took the entire Bratz data set and the entire Atlas data set and looked whether this normative distribution was powerful enough to identify the abnormalities in there. So what we got was actually quite motivating. Um, so you have these three curves here, AUC curves, for two different data sets, the brain tumors and the stroke lesions. The curves here, the straight lines, are basically the random chance curves. The curves here are what has been done before we introduced the Bayesian models. And all the curves here are basically variations of the Bayesian model that I showed. So actually, just integrating the Bayesian model and the prior uh, with the right normative distribution, you can really push the AUCs quite high. Um, in terms of images, what it looks like is, well, on the top, I show you the images with the lesions. So the five here are tumors. The two here, um, no, actually, they're all tumors, sorry. Um, on the second row, I show the restored results. So basically, the closest actual real looking or healthy looking image that um, closest to the image with the tumor. And then we show the differences. Now, it's obvious that actually the model is not really able to find um, the, the, the real looking um, counterpart of this image with the lesion. But still, the differences are enough to identify the, um, the abnormalities to some extent. And at the very, very last point, I want to make one um, point, which is, so usually when people use these deep learning models, you know, they train deep learning models, and then they compare it with um, last year's best performing models and say that I beat them by 2% and published the paper. But actually, in our experiments, what we figured out that actually the best model that works for this problem was date back to 2001. And we've had many attempts to basically beat this model. The AUCs were really, really high, 0.8. Only now we're actually kind of on par with the super old model. So it's actually, I think there is something to say. Um, and for comparisons, if you actually run, you know, a simple um, segmentation model, which is one image on the brain tumors, you'd get an AUC or dice scores of 0.8, while we're at the dice scores of 0.4. So it's a really uh, different ballpark for the unsupervised learning case. Um, with that, I will end. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer.